All right, let's get on with the message today. I want to appreciate you, Andrew, Tash, and the worship team for leading us in such a powerful time of worship. This week's Torah portion, can anyone tell me what it was about? Oh, that was a resounding response there. What was the Torah portion about this weekend? There was a lot. If you could sum it up, what would, what would it be? You're all, you're all thinking there's a wrong answer here. There's no, there's no real one. The binding of Isaac. That's a great one. If you had have said Abraham, you would have been correct. If you'd have said Isaac, you would have been correct. If you had have said Jesus, you even would have been correct. Okay, so Abraham was what we're looking at. And today, the title of my message is called The Test of Faith. We're going to be looking at the 10 trials of Abraham's life. We might not get through all 10, but we're going to be looking at the trials that he went through in his life. The reason that we're looking at this today in particular is that if you were to uh, listen to any of the doctors that talk about people's lives, their mental health, psychology, the state of a person's well-being, they will tell you that in a person's lifetime, a person will experience up to 12 major crises. They'll go through something incredible that has the opportunity to break them or the opportunity to make them. Uh, many children are born, born into poor homes all around the world. That is an immediate crisis that they have the opportunity to live that way for the rest of their life or an opportunity to change. Someone who goes through losing a child, that is a crisis. Someone who loses a job or a career that they've held on to for a long time, that's a crisis. Someone who's started a business and gone bankrupt, that's a crisis. Someone who's gone through the heartbreak of a relationship, that's a crisis. These are all crises that are not uncommon to mankind. If I was to say today, who's been through a crisis, every one of us would resonate. We have been through some sort of crisis. We've gone through COVID. There's one crisis we've been through together. The US election, there's another crisis. Oh, no, sorry, I said that out loud. I promised I wasn't going to talk about politics today. <laughs> Notice everyone's a bit on edge. You know? <laughs> Red's on this side, blue's on that side. <laughs> But where I want to preach today is that there are four ways people deal with crisis. And I want to look at that in comparison to how Abraham lived his life to give us an input on how we're to handle the crisis or the events or the opportunities around us. We're going to use the Torah portion to give us some life, life advice, not life advice, life advice today. So there are four ways that we process information when a crisis is presented to us. The first is that we simplify the message. The second is that we hold on to current beliefs. The third is we look for additional information and opinions. And the fourth is we believe the first message. If you were to be a counsellor and you were to start talking to people about how to work through a crisis, it would be some version of similarity to those four things. In the examples I'm about to give of Abraham, in every one of them, the process has been similar for him. So to, to help with the Torah portion for this week, I'm going to start with the beginning and give you the end. Is that okay? It's going to make it very, very simple. In the beginning, Genesis 22, if you've got your Bibles, feel free to open there with me. Genesis 22. And it happened after these things that God tested Abraham. Wow, that's a good start. Thank you, God. Thank you for testing us. Thank you for testing Abraham. Let's go through the 10 very quickly. Does anyone know the first test of Abraham? Was the call? Uh, that was the 10th one. That's all right. You're already at the end part, which is great. The first one, the first test was the call from his homeland. If you know anything about what they believed the era of the Chaldeans was like, it was a metropolis. It was a city that you did not just decide you wanted to go away from. It would be like leaving an income and it would be like leaving everything perfect about your life to go camping forever. Now, some might say that sounds like a very nice thing. I actually like there's an appeal to that. Except he had no destination, except he had no promise of income, and he had no idea what he was doing. The famine in Canaan was another one. Can you imagine if Abraham had had the promise of God and he goes, I'm going to go to this wonderful land and now there's a famine in this land? How am I meant to live in this land? Third was the abduction of Sarah in Egypt. Fourth was the war of four kings. The fifth was a long wait for a son and his marriage to Hagar. The fifth was the commandment of circumcision. I'm sure he toiled with this decision in crisis for a very, very long time. There's places I could go, but I'm not going to today. The abduction of Sarah by Abimelech, which is the second time, by the way, that his wife got abducted or taken. The exile of Hagar after she gave birth. The exile of Ishmael and the sacrifice of Isaac. These were the ten major trials of, of Abraham's life. 
Now, I don't know about you, but they're pretty significant things to happen. I've never had my wife taken hostage, let alone once, not twice. She has not been taken hostage. But can you imagine, uh, husbands, what that would be like if your wife had been taken hostage? That would be dreadful. <laughs> You're not allowed to laugh, Jim. <laughs> not, this is not a laugh moment. You know. <clears throat> Dean, can we organise a free coffee for Kaz after the service? <laughs> That's the beginning, all right? So Genesis 22, it says God tested Abraham. Now, James 2 verses 23 gives us the ending, and it says Scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And at the end of his life, he was called a friend of God. So the beginning is that he was tested by God throughout his life. The ending is that he was credited with righteousness and called a friend of God. That sounds an awful like, lot like God saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Does it not? And so God promises, Jesus promises that in our lifetime are going to come persecutions, tribulations and trials. But how do we deal with those? That's what I want to look at today. So first is we simplify the message. How would a psychologist deal with a person who has just, just lost a child? Well, they would, not, they would know that the person wouldn't fully hear the message that they're about to bring because of an inability to judge multiple facts during a crisis. That's what happens when you and I are in a crisis. I just want to ask very quickly, has anybody been in a crisis within the last five years, maybe excluding COVID because I know we could all put our hands up, but has anyone been through anything that has, that has wrought heartache or, or a distrust or something like that in the last five years? Okay, there's many of us this morning. So we know that when something happens, when a relationship breaks down, when there's, when there's divorce, when there are these kind of things happening, the first thing we do is we, we lose sight of our facts. And everything becomes about feelings. Everything becomes about how we feel in the moment and we lose sight of logic. But what happens then is we resort to this thing called values, faith, discipline. So if you were to deal with someone, what you would be doing is, is you would be, uh, they would be not remembering as much of the information as they normally would. A person going through divorce doesn't realize that their husband still loves them or that their spouse still loves them. They're feeling the pain. A person going through heartbreak recognizes the same. A person who's lost a child doesn't, may not want to hear that their child is now with the Lord. Is that right? The information is there, but it's an appropriateness to present the information, right? And so at that time, the bleeding heart can go and do things. When someone's in a crisis, did you know that one of the, it, one of the well, this makes sense and it's very logical, but, but a, a huge factor in suicide is a current crisis. Not just depression, not just anxiety, but the imminency of a crisis. People lose sight of logic and rely then on feelings. What can be feelings? Without minimizing feelings today, it can be chemical uh, chemistry happening in our own mind. And so there is a layer of chemistry where we have to go deeper and rely on our core values. And that is what will often happen. We appeal to the values that a person has. Uh, friends, I'm, I do not aim to give a psychology course today. I just want to look at these four things very simply. Let's go to Genesis 12. Genesis 12, 1. It says this. And the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people and your father's household and to the land I will show you. What did Abraham do very simply? He believed in God. That was a crisis whether he enjoyed it or not. It was a crisis for either him, for Sarah, for Lot, for any of the maidservants that were used to living in, uh, the, in the, the land of Ur or the land of the Chaldeans. I can promise you something, that if I tried to go and move from this city without telling Tash, we would have a problem. <laughs> Love, just letting you know, we're going to the uh, Great Sandy Desert for a few years. <laughs> She'd shake her head at me and be like, yes, you are. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I think that's how it would go, something like that. So the end of this story tells us in Acts 7 verses 3 why he believed and what he valued. Acts 7 verses 3. Leave your country and your kindred and go to the land I will show you. And so Abraham left the land of the Chaldeans and he settled in Haran. After his father died, God brought him out of that place and into the land that you're now living. He gave him no inheritance there, not even a foot of ground. Isn't that nice? No inheritance, no foot of ground, nothing. 
But God promised to give possession of the land to Abraham and his descendants, even though he did not yet have a child. God told him that his descendants would be foreigners in a strange land and that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. Again, a lovely, nice word. Has anyone heard a prophecy like that personally over them before? You know, just letting you know, you will have zero inheritance and you will have 400 years of your descendants being in slavery. Thank you. Can you imagine? I would be sitting there going, well, that's the sign of a false prophet right there. You know, that, that, that's not the nicest word to receive from anyone. And yet Abraham took that word as negative as it sounded and he believed that God was in it. It was the truth of God speaking in that, that got him through. And he said, I will punish the nation that that enslaves them, God said, and afterwards they'll come forth and worship me in this place. So what Abraham relied on in the moment of his first crisis, which was going from the land of the Chaldeans, was his disciplines to the Lord. When we have a crisis, our first response must be to our disciplines to the Lord. If we're not going to uh, uh, face the facts and we're going to be feeling the emotions, then we better have some disciplines that underlie the emotions that we're feeling. I can tell you when you're going through something terrible and difficult, the last thing you want to do is pray. Sometimes. When you're going through a crisis, the last thing you want to do is give. When you're going through a crisis, the last thing you want to do is be generous to other people. I, I don't know when the last time you had someone over to your house was, but... I can tell you that if Tash and I were having an argument, not that that's a crisis, I hope not. Um, but that's not the time you want to have people over to your house. That's not generally the time you decide you want to give to someone. That's not generally the time you decide you immediately want to pray. And yet, Abraham didn't forsake his disciplines. We read more about that. So what am I trying to say here? Is when things come your way, what are the disciplines that you immediately rely on that underpin your faith and your belief. The three that I can immediately think of, of, I've just mentioned. Prayer, it's an appointment with God twice a day. It's, it's the unknown Moadim. Did you know that? In Genesis, Deuteron sorry, in Deuteronomy, it, recall, it calls it as one of the main appointments with God twice a day. How are we going with that? It's measurable. It's very measurable. Do you pray at least twice a day? I'm not asking for a roll call right now, by the way. Do you pray twice a day? So is that habit in your life so that when the crisis comes, that's underpinning what you do? Do you give out of your habitual nature to give because you know it's something that God loves? Let's forget tithing for a moment, but just being generous. Do you look after the poor? Do you love seeing your neighbor bless? Is your heart generous when people come around to your house and you just give them food or give them things? I think most of our congregation is like that, actually. I, I think we're very, very good at being generous. You are very good at being generous. And so is your heart's response like that? What about fasting? Is your heart's response when you're believing for your brother or sister to be healed or they're going through a crisis to stop and fast? What spiritual disciplines do you have underpinning your life and walk with, the God, with God? The second thing that we do in relation to going through crises is we hold on to our current beliefs. If our belief is that God doesn't heal and that we haven't seen him heal, that's the belief that enters the crisis with you. You can see the danger of that, right? If you believe that God is not a good father, that's the belief that enters the crisis with you. You might have the habit, but that's the crisis that goes on. Good morning, Joy. It's great to see you this morning. I didn't notice you before. And now I've made it awkward, haven't I? <laughs> Good to see you, Joy. Thank you for joining us today. So we hold on to our current beliefs. And so we believe, like let's take, for example, a hurricane. And this happens in the States all the time. Uh, we know many of the, the states they go through, in the US, they go through hurricanes from time to time. And if it, it was safe in our house once, we believe it was safe in our house again. So if we endured a hurricane and we found it a safe place to be in our house, and then the next time the hurricane comes, we say, it's safe, we will be here, that's the crisis. But what in fact actually happens is the hurricane comes and destroys the house, that belief was wrong, you're dead. You don't get a second option at that. And so we have to believe and have our faith and have our belief in God in check that we know what we're carrying through. Uh, it is so unfortunate that I've talked to Christians every day who have no idea about their belief. 
every day, not in this church, I'm not talking about our church, but I'm talking about people who believe that God does not heal, that God does not want the best for them, that God does not want them to have children, that God does not want them to prosper in their business, that God does not, does not, does not, does not, and they cannot come with a God does. That is disbelief. And we, friends, need to develop belief in our heart around God. What is God saying to us? And so here in Genesis 16, we see the story about Sarah. This is one of the other trials. Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarah had said. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan for 10 years, Sarah took his wife, his, uh, took took his wife, took the Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to to her husband to be his wife. So Sarah had a belief that she was too old to have a child. She didn't believe the word of God that said, you will have a child. Can you imagine if you had God speak to you in that way and you didn't believe? I mean, all of us have the ability to do this. God speaks, we don't believe. God speaks, it's not in our time frame, we don't believe. I believe we probably all had that happen at some point. And just... A bit of honesty, has anyone tried to make God's word happen? Maybe a prophetic word? Like, thank you. Leon's like, Leon, you're not the liar here. Um, we've all tried to make God's will happen ahead of time. We've pushed our own way. And sometimes prophecy is best enacted through the wisdom of hindsight. Sometimes the prophet, prophecy exists to bring a warning and a change in repentance but sometimes the prophecy exists so that we can give glory to God when the things that he prophesied about happen on their own. Isn't that incredible? There's a speaker there. Careful of that one. And so we hold on to our beliefs. Our current situation, the crisis can dictate to us what's going on. And friends, we need to be careful that we have our belief about God in check. What do you believe about God? Uh, I know for many years I believed that God couldn't use an 18-year-old when I was in Mozambique. It took a whole plane flight to Mozambique and God ministering to my heart to tell me that he could do anything through this little man, this little man who just would believe. Uh, many of you heard this story before, but I jump off the plane in Mozambique at 18 years of age and I'm presented with a man uh, who had committed suicide. The family wanted me to go and preach to their family. Uh, about life and death, heaven and hell. Basically, he said, win my family by telling the family that they're going to hell and that he's gone to hell. You know, that kind of witnessing doesn't always work <laughs> if you've ever tried it, okay? And so I jump off the plane. Uh, we're there to cut the story short. I'm there and thinking, what can I do, God? What can I say? How can I bring your hope? How can I bring the love of Jesus? And a man comes up to me. He's the grandfather and he has cataracts over his eyes. He's blind. He couldn't see. And as he comes up to me, I think, gosh, I don't even know where to begin. God, please help me. And maybe you've prayed a desperate prayer before. I'm sure we all have. Like that, please, Lord, do something. And so I put my hand over his eyes and prayed the weakest faith prayer I have ever prayed. It was like, Lord, please, if it's your will, if you would, just please do something, please. <laughs> Wasn't the faithful prayer that, you know, usually be healed. You know, it was nothing like that. And when I took my hands away from his eyes, I was sort of like, you know, just have, just have a look. And his eyes were staring back at me with the crystal brown eyes, dark brown eyes of an African man, staring back with complete healing. And he was healed. The family didn't need a message about the, 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 the turn and burn, <laughs> stern and burn them. They didn't need that message. They just needed a message and they needed to experience the power of God and their belief was lifted in a moment. What do we believe about God? I can tell you since that day, my faith has never changed that if God said lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. I've got friends at the moment who are sitting in hospital. I've mentioned this a number of weeks ago that are waiting on the miracle of God. And I still pray and you still pray. Our church prays for these guys that God would do a miracle. Because, you know, friends, when God says it, it's never over till it's over. And even if it's over and hasn't played out how we think, God still wins. We don't get to dictate the situation that we want. We get to experience the win of God. And we as people, we feel the result one way or another. But God's saying here is, what do you believe? Let it go beyond just your feelings and believe what I say. I just, 
I mean, oh, the, thank you, Juliet. I thought you had something to add to that. And so Abraham's situation was that she didn't believe that it could be done on its own. She couldn't see past the, uh, the fact that God wanted to provide a miracle here, and she made it happen on her own. Sarah made way, and by the way, they both made way. It was, it was Abraham and Sarah. And it, uh, please, if you ever hear me say something that comes across slightly uh, one way towards men or one way towards women, just forgive me as a pastor, okay? I never mean anything. I believe God loves men and women equally, and we have a wonderful job together to do for this world. Is that a fair statement? Great. All right. We've covered equality. Awesome. I didn't anticipate covering that today, but we got there. <laughs> and so what do you believe? Believe it and don't falter. If you believe that God says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We preached on this a few weeks ago. Then lay hands on the sick. If you believe that God says, no sickness shall come into your household, believe it. I believe no COVID will even think about coming into my house because I believe the word of God. And every time sickness comes into my house, I feel like I've got a job to kick that little thing out. You know, my children come home from kindy with a little bit of a sniffle and I get angry and I hope my kids never think I'm angry at them. But I get angry that, they, that the enemy would try and use childcare to bring in a sickness into my house. What do you believe? I get sick and tired of hearing about Christian businesses failing because I believe that God has said that we should prosper. I get sick of hearing that laws get passed that are anti-God. We were talking last week about euthanasia, abortion, the laws in our government. I don't give a flip who's in, in charge of our government. God is. The person who's a figurehead there at the moment, they need not consult my belief of faith because my belief of faith is my belief of faith. Your belief of faith is your belief of faith. And so when they try and govern what should happen, friends, this is what I'm saying to you is you need to be the ones that stand up and express your opinion. It doesn't really matter who's in charge. God's in charge. You hearing what I'm saying? Our country is in a place of crisis. Our states are in a place of crisis. And now we need to validate the world and tell them what they believe. We tell them, not the other way around. I feel like I'm a little, on a little bit of a soapbox here, but I think it's a good soapbox, right? This is what we need to do. As Pastor Jim eloquently mentioned earlier, we pray we establish what is going to happen in the spiritual and we speak it out in the natural. When we start to preach in our churches, there should be an objective nature to what God wants in this world and what he wants in our country, not a subjective one. If you ask me any question about the Torah, I will tell you what God stands for you because he's objective on it. Does God value homosexuality? No, he does not. He values the person. He hates the act. Does God value sex outside of marriage? No, he values the person. He hates the act. He wants the person but he hates the act. What does God believe about lying? He hates the act. He loves the person. And what is he going to do? He's going to reach out and try and develop a community of believers who are firm in their faith and firm in their understanding and who come back to this thing and say, I believe. I'm going to have to teach you to clap again, aren't I, family? And I'm not just picking on some of the sinful things. You know, when God says have integrity in business, I believe that he says have integrity in business. How do we run our business? How do we run our church? How do we value people who are volunteers? How do we value people who are our employees? These are things which God is objective on. And if we understand what we understand about the scriptures, then it's black and white. We can walk it forward. I'm surprised at the amount of churches that try and teach the Old Testament is no longer relevant. I figure that if the Old Testament's relevant, then we have become relevant to a world that needs God. The relevance of the scriptures is the objectivity that God gives us about his character. He is an infinite God who says, how can I communicate to my finite beings that I've created about me? Let me write it down and give it to them so that they can see that I love them. Let them see that I want this for them and that it is how it is to live a good life. And so we need to know what we believe. That is how we work through. When a person's facing a crisis, it is through what we believe as a core value is how we get through it. The third is we look for additional information and opinions. So when a person's going through a crisis, they will immediately turn on the TV I'm not sure how many people searched the internet over the last couple of days and searched up US election 2020, Trump or Biden, question mark. 
And we look for validation. When we look, when we look for the, the Queensland elections, we look for validation. Who won? What happened? Car crash on the M1. We switch on the social media. Which way is it going? How did it happen? Validate. Validation. Validation. How to raise a child in God's way. Validation. When we're going through crisis, we look for validation from people through media, through different ways. And so this information can be destructive to our lives if it's the wrong information. You know, a friend of mine, a couple of years ago, were having a discussion about his marriage. And there were a lot of people that were having their say in his marriage. I was speaking to his wife. And I remember thinking, there's a lot of additional information going on here. And people are good at meddling, aren't they? <laughs> people are good at meddling. This is one of the reasons why I believe God is against gossip and slander. Because it is the wrong kind of information that meddles in a situation where God is actually desiring the outcome. So what we have is slander and gossip being additional information which is impacting how God wants to get the glory here. How good is it? How good are we at people at meddling? You're all very silent because you're probably like, oh yes, but you don't want to say it. How good are we at peop as people at having opinions about other people's stuff? Yeah? We're good at it. We're great at having a comment here and there. But do you know the only comment that really should matter is what God says. So how do we do it? Well, many of us will change the television channel. We'll try and call friends and family. We'll turn to a known and credible leader or local leader. And we'll check multiple social media channels to see what our contacts are saying. That is how people going through crisis will validate what they're feeling. Uh, a person going through divorce will go on and try and validate their feeling for, for, for moving by talking to some of their Christian or non-Christian friends to validate their decision of leaving their husband or wife. Is that right? And so they speak and that, that they get additional information. A person going through a business, uh, wanting to close a business down or, or, or bankruptcy uh, will get additional information saying this is how you do it, this is how you eliminate your debt, this is how you get away with as much as possible. Additional information. We all search in a crisis for additional information, but there is such a potential for that information to be wrong. And so we need to come back to the right information. This is where I want to tell you about Abraham in Genesis 18, 17 to 21, where God gives him the information, but there's a reason he gives him the information. Who wants the voice of God in their life? All right. Let me show you what happened that gave Abraham the voice of God and the wisdom of God and the prophecy of God in a situation. Genesis 18. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation? What's happening there? God is saying, I'm going to do something. Shall I hide it from Abraham? This is God who doesn't need to consult you. He doesn't need to consult mankind on what he's about to do. Except it tells us that he does nothing before letting the prophets know. Is that right? And so God here is about to reveal something to Abraham because Abraham is something. What is the something? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and that all of the nations on the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and doing justice, so that the Lord may bring about Abraham what he's promised to him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is grave, I will go down to see whether they have done this altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. What were the three elements that seemed to mean that Abraham would be revealed what God was about to do? Let me read them to you now. The first is that he would keep the way. This is the first point in scripture that we see this word way being used. Has anybody ever known where, uh, seen the word way used in the scriptures before? It's used 51 times. That's the first reference to the way. The last reference, or one of the major references rather, is in, is in the book of uh, John. John 14, 1 verses 7, and we have Jesus speaking. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you there myself. And where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you are going. 
how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you'd known me, you'd have known my Father also. From now on, you do. You do know him and you've seen him. And so what it's talking about here is when he says that he will keep the way, that way is the focus pointing towards Messiah. Right back at Abraham's promise, God revealed to his prophet Abraham what was about to happen in Sodom and Gomorrah because he was going to keep the way. That's a belief of righteous, or belief in Messiah which imputes righteousness to you through faith. You with me? The second, by the way, the way there, the Hebrew word is derech, which is way, road, distance, journey, manner, roadway, path, journey, direction, manner, habit, way. What does that sound a little bit like? Is there another word that's very similar to that one that we use? Torah. The living instruction. The mark. Also used as the way. So what is referring here is referring to either the written word, the written Torah, or the living word being Jesus. And so he was going to be a keeper of the way. Faith in the Messiah. Faith to live how Jesus wants him to live. What's the second word there? The second word is righteousness, to live righteous. We have to make distinction now between the way and righteousness because there are three uses of these things. They're all different words and they mean different parts. So the word for righteousness is tzedekah, which is righteous acts of judgment. Does anybody know what the righteousness tzedekah means? It means beyond the call of duty righteous. If a righteous person is righteous because he takes in strangers, as we found by Lot, then the, then the tzedekah version of that would be to let them stay as long as they need. If you were to be a righteous person in giving, say 10% tithe, then the tzedekah, the righteousness, would be for you to give up to 100%. If you and your job were giving away things and you had run out of things to give away as freebies, the tzedekah would be to find a way to give another way, a, th a thing away free. It's beyond the call of duty. To the volunteer, it's the person who says, I'm going to be on once a month or twice a month and ends up coming every day or every week or every... That's the tzedekah. That's the righteousness that he's talking about. It's upholding the standard of righteousness to the nth degree. Going above and beyond. Thank you, Tash. That's the word. The third one there is mishpat which is the justice or judgment, mishpat. These three, by the way, you will see occurring in Scripture all the time. You will see the commands of God, the judgments of God, and the testimonials of God. Each relate to the commands of God. Mishpat, uh, mitzvah, or mitzvot. You'll see also chuchot, which is the statutes. Statutes are commands that you just do not argue with, okay? When, when uh, Tash tells Zion to do something and he says, but, but why mum? My mama. It, because I'm mum. That's why, or you are. That's a, that's a chuchot. That's a statute. Don't argue with God when he says that. When, when he says, don't lie with your sister, that's a chuchot. When he, when, there's a few in there, by the way. When he says for men, in, uh, Jewish men, not to cut their, their sideburns, this is relating to Jewish identity, not Gentile identity, that is a chuchot. Do we know why God doesn't want the Jewish men to cut their, their sideburns? We don't understand it fully. But it's a chuchot, which means, I'm God, don't argue. That's what that means. When it says to the Jewish people, the Jewish men, and not Gentile men, are you, are you all understanding the difference here, what I'm saying here? G Gentile identity, Jewish identity. When it says to the Jewish men that they're, to round the corners of their, they're not to round the corners of their beard, that is a chuchot, which means that I'm God, do it because I said. That's what it is. The other ones you can ask questions about. God gives a lot of explanation about but on those ones, he doesn't want you to argue. He just wants obedience. So mishpatim, what is the mishpatim? It is the civil commands that help run a community the right way. These are the civil commands of God. So when, when he says you will keep the way, you will do righteousness, and you will, you will observe justice, it is the justice that helps a community get along. And it is the commands that relate to us loving our neighbor. And so what he was saying to Abraham is, I can see that you're going to have a faith in, in the Messiah. I can see that you're going to follow the commands of God that I give you. I can see that you're going to value the culture. And I can see that you're going to love one another to the nth degree. That's what the kingdom of heaven looks like. 
And so if each of us start to get that in our life, that means that God is going to start revealing things to us. Whenever you wonder if someone's a false prophet and they, and they fail the, we're going to call it the Deuteronomy 13 test and the Deuteronomy 18 test, which means that it doesn't line up with the Torah, then you have to ask that person, do you actually value the way, the commands and the righteousness and the justice of God? Because only then does it seem that God seems to want to give a person something to go forward with. We believe what we are validated with. We believe what we're validated with. Let's get the opinion of God. Let's live a righteous life so we get that validation. The fourth and final is we believe the first message. When someone's in a crisis, the first thing someone hears is probably what they're going to go with. And so what we need to do is make sure that the first thing we say to someone is the right thing. We don't talk to a, a couple who's just broken up in a relationship that might get together again and might get married. We, well, he wasn't good for you anyway. You know, you, we have to be careful with what we tell people first. Someone's business is on the brink of, of destruction. Oh, well, there probably wasn't a future in that business anyway. <laughs> Better you get out. <laughs> you know, we've got to be careful with what information we present to people because we're accountable for it. But when someone's going through a crisis, we're very good at going, here's the information and let's walk away. We need to make sure that the right information is coming to them. Genesis 22 verses 1 to 2 says, After these things God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, here I am, he said. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mount of which I shall show you. What was the information that Abraham had been presented with first by God? Not in that passage, but first. Do you know? The message he'd been given first is, Abraham, you will have descendants as numerous as the stars and as numerous as the sand on the, on the, on the ocean bed and on the floor. Your descendants. And you know what would, was happening in Abraham's mind as he was hearing God say, sacrifice your son. In his mind, the first message he's received was, but God, you said. I'll be obedient, but you said. And so Abraham walked to the, mount, the mountain, Mount Moriah, with full faith that should the knife plunge into Isaac, that he would see Isaac resurrected. And in that manner, the rabbis tell us that the ashes of Isaac were burnt as a burnt offering. Now, we know that Isaac was never sacrificed. He had been. And we know God's not into child sacrifice, by the way. Otherwise, that would have made a wonderful precedence for God being a really, really evil God. And so in the story, he spares Isaac and provides the ram. Just in the same way that God provided the ram, the lamb from heaven, who was sent down for your behalf, my behalf, so that our sins would be depleted, forgotten, wiped away. You know, it was the ashes of Isaac. It was on that very spot that Abraham remembered the first message. And I believe, friends, that he had no doubt. What's the first message you receive in a crisis? Is it the word of God? Or is it doubt? And if it's not the word of God, we need to get ourselves around people who bring the word of God. Thank you. <laughs> Romans ten seventeen says, faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God. Friends, I want to just end today with this idea that everything I have mentioned talks about the core values that we have, the people around us that we have, the validation that comes from God, and what God has already spoken to us. They are the four things, really, that we can see consistent throughout the life of Abraham. Are those four things active in your life at this moment? Because those four things represent faith. If faith comes by hearing and hearing from the Word of God, that means, and we're not in the Bible every day, then we're not hearing the Word of God. If we're not around people every day who speak our language, who speak the language of faith, then we're not in the Word every day. If we're not spending time in prayer with the Holy Spirit, then we're not in the Word and we're not hearing every day. Friends, today is a day to start a decision to activate your faith. I've been talking with Pastor Jim about his preaching next week and we're very excited, Pastor Jim. But I can tell you, start your faith journey being active today so that next week when Pastor Jim comes and talks even further, that you're ready to go. Love it if you could stand with me. Worship team, would you please come? I'm, I mentioned a few weeks ago that there was a dissatisfaction in my heart. I can tell you story of story over story of the scriptures 
where the disciples were rebuked by Jesus for something, what were they rebuked of? Lack of faith. Rebuked over and again for a lack of faith. Friends, we can know the scriptures, but unless we act the scriptures, then we lack in faith. What does James tell us? Be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And so we need to activate our faith today. I, I, I know some of us haven't seen a miracle in a very long time. Some of us haven't seen a demon cast out in a very long time. Did you know that it says when, the, when, when you cast out a demon by my name, the kingdom of heaven has come upon you? Did you know that? Does anybody want the kingdom of heaven to come upon them? I do. So where are the demons? I mean, that, that to me is just logical. How are we going with activating our faith everywhere? I'm not wanting to bash anyone up today, but this is a thing that should be a staple for each of our lives. How are we going laying hands on the sick? How are we going inviting people into part of our community? I had a, a friend earlier this week, or he became a friend. His name was Brandon, and he might be watching online today. And if you are, Brandon, congratulations on the birth of your child. I was doing pest control, as we do. I had two wonderful conversations, actually, this week. And every week, I'll tell you that at least probably 80% of my conversations were wonderful, and they are every week. Why? Because I believe God has a reason for every conversation. And I believe He's got a reason for every conversation with you as well. And so I'm, I'm, I'm doing the pest control for Brandon. We get three seconds into me opening up the bedroom cupboards and I find out he's pregnant. He's not pregnant. His wife is pregnant. It's a miracle. It's not the right kind of miracle. And he starts telling me a little bit about his life and that he's got an injury from basketball. He's a tall guy. And so anyway, this conversation goes on. Well, Brandon and his wife are looking to probably come and be part of our community folks. Off a simple conversation through general kindness, just, just general people being general people with a belief of God and a commonality that we believe that God in community will better us all. Is that not a fair statement? And so our love for neighbours should be about who can we bring into our community so that we can extend the love of God to them. We can become an exclusive club. That's, that's sure, no problem. But that's not what I believe the Messiah wants. He wants your faith activated. My second conversation of the day was with a Muslim man named Abdul. Do you know what? He was kinder to me than most Christians. In that, he made me a cup of coffee while I was doing pest control. And he ma- it's my love language. Coffee is my love language, guys. <laughs> and as we're talking, I said, what do, you, what do you think about Christians? And he said, well, I can't understand why Christians are so hypocritical. This is, this is the Muslim man. I'm thinking, oh, what comes out of his mouth next is going to be very interesting. I said, what, why is that? He said, because they were on one hand, Look at the scriptures from the Torah. Now, they've got the Torah in their Quran as well. And they'll they'll have a problem with homosexuality and believe it's an abomination. And yet in the passage just before it, it talks about not eating unclean animals. And that's also an abomination. And now there's a hypocrisy. He said, how can they look at what God seems to see as something good for their life and say, this is an abomination, but that's not an abomination. Who made them the judge? This is the conversation with a Muslim man, uninvited to go this far, by the way. It just sort of went that far. And I said, oh, you know what? I agree. And I said, there's a problem in the Western world where the Christians are told that the first half of this book is no longer relevant to their lives. And it's a shame because it means it's based. the rest of it's based on nothing. The Jesus that we believe in, if we don't base on the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, whatever you like to call it, is based on a lie that makes Jesus a false prophet. If the words that we believe about Jesus are not based on what it says in here, and we don't value what it says in here, then the Jesus we serve is nothing but a false God, and we have become subject to worshipping idols. Can you see the logic in that? And so God is saying, hey, listen, the world is seeing you. And the world wants a strong faith. But where it's looking for a strong faith and a strong God, it's finding weak Christians. Our faith activated is both in hearing and doing. And friends, we have to be, unlike the Liberal National Party, strong. 
three years ago, their values came out. Of, you remember Tony Abbott? Not three years ago, beyond that. He said a strong leadership. Do you remember that? The placard that talked about strong leadership? Does anybody remember? Str- the, 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 the whole placard that they were putting forward was strong. Conservative values, strong. Friends, if the government won't do it for us, we need to be the strong. You and I need to know what we believe. We need to research it together. And if there's a dispute, let us not leave the table with one another until we've sorted it out. Let's activate our understanding. And from our activation of understanding comes the power to see the world changed around us. Today, I'm going to make a call wherever you are. And you can respond and come and get prayer as well. But if you want an activation in your faith to walk stronger, to walk more powerfully, but also to walk in an understanding of the scripture, then I'd love you to come forward today so that our team can pray for you. Because I believe unless we equip this army first for the work of the gospel to take ground wherever we are, then we can't just have visitors coming to church. It has to be more than that. God's given you the mandate to make disciples wherever you are. respond and come to the front this morning. Our team is going to pray. Cam, Carol, Pastor Jim, any of the team, we're going to pray for you and believe that God's going to give you the instruction on how you can walk forward in faith. Father, today I thank you that your word is strong. Father, I thank you that you're creating us as strong people. Father, I thank you that there would not be weakness in us, weakness of the world. Lord, we know your word tells us that we're a friend with the world, then we're at enmity with you. God, we don't want to be at enmity with you. We want to be friends of God, like Abraham. Father, today we thank you for your goodness and mercy and the the hope that we have in Jesus. We walk forward in that loving life of Jesus, that grace that's given to us. But Lord, show us how to live. Show us how to be holy. Show us how to walk forward in your strength, God. We give you all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to make one remark before people start to respond been talking with a good friend of mine about why there have been so much false prophecy around the world recently. Do you know why I believe there's been so much false prophecy? It's because people don't know this. So what does it mean they're hearing? False spirits. What is the thing that draws us into a closer relationship with God and understanding of God? This. Knowing His Word, knowing His character, spending time with Him. Friends, don't leave that up to chance. If you want to respond this morning, we're going to worship, but feel welcome to come respond. I'd love to pray for people to be activated in their workplace. Okay, if I can have 80% of my conversations being about God, I believe you can be can too. If you want that, you lack the courage or, or whatever it is, I want to pray for you this morning. I'm not an evangelist. I just believe that God's got a purpose for every conversation that you have. So let's pray. Thank you, Gary.